joining us tonight to our first session of three um, for what we hope will be an amazing speaker series hosted by Wrestle Like a Girl and Division I Women's Wrestling. Our goal for this series is to educate and empower women to join coaching, but also to showcase the numerous careers and advocacy roles that exist outside of simply coaching. We recognize that there may be very <laughs> a lot of men watching this event, and we welcome them to please stay. <laughs> this will be a great opportunity to continue to learn regardless of questions, uh, regardless of the gender lens presented by our speakers. My name is Emma Randall, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's group. Our topic is exploring coaching as a career. I'm honored to present tonight's speakers, and I'm excited to take notes from all the worms of, words of wisdom that there are going to share. First, I'll read each speaker's bio and then we'll jump into some pre-selected questions. We'll have time at the end to answer additional questions from our audience. Um, as we go, please feel free to drop in questions into the chat. Awesome. Change this slide. All right, our speakers tonight. First up is Monica Allen. Monica is the CEO of Sisters on the Mat. She began the program in 2016 and has run it to present day. Uh, she was the NWCA Texas State Women's Wrestling Chairman 2021 to present. The Fannin Middle School Head Coach um, and Special Education Teacher from 2019 to present. The formal Azul High School Head Wrestling Coach from 2013 to 2018. Previous to that, she served as a volunteer non-paid coach from 2007 to 2013. She was the Texas Women's Director for the USA Wrestling Chapter from 2013 to 2016. She was the Team Texas National Team Coach from 2009 to 2012, and she was a graduate of Missouri Valley College in 2005. So thank you, Monica, and welcome. <laughs> Next up, we have Othella Lucas. She grew up in San Diego before attending the University of the Cumberlands. She moved to Colorado to compete for the U.S. Army World Class Athlete Program. She recently completed her third season as the girls head coach from Fountain Fort Carson High School. Thanks, Othella, for hopping on. I know you're figuring out your camera and figuring out the audio, but we're excited to see your lovely face. Next up, we have Cassie Archambault. In 2019, Cassie was named the head coach of the wrestling program at her alma mater, Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. Um, Archambault was a three-year varsity wrestle, wrestler for Phillips Academy, the first female to place at Class A in the Northeastern Prep League Tournament, and a place winner at Girls National Wrestling Tournament. She served as the assistant coach for seven years before stepping into the head coaching role. In 2022, she was named as the NEPSWA Coach of the Year and National Prep Coach of the Year. In 2014, she started the Phillips Academy Girls Wrestling Tournament, which had nine participants in its inaugural year and has since grown to over 100 participants. She serves as the Director of Girls Wrestling in the New England Prep School League. So thank you, Cassie. I feel like I'm the only one clapping when it's a webinar every time. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, last but not least is Gabby Weyrich at McKendry. Weyrich was a team captain and a WCA, w, I'm sorry, WCWA national finalist during her undergrad days. As an assistant coach, she helped the Bearcats to team titles in the NCAA division of the National Collegiate Women's Wrestling Championships in 2020, 2021, and 2022. That's a three-peat. And four top three finishes at the WCWA National Duels. Today, she's the head coach of the Southern Oregon University program. In her first year as head coach, she led the team to a national title and a national dual title. <laughs> uh, she became the first woman to lead the national title at the, at, or the first woman to lead a team to a national title at the collegiate level. So, welcome, Gabby. Awesome. I'm so excited for tonight's panel. I've got my notes ready. 
I've got my pen out. I'm ready to take some, some serious notes and learn. So what we're going to start with is we'll briefly go around the room and we'll have each of our guest speakers share their own journey into coaching. So we will start with you, Cassie. <laughs> Hi there, thanks for having me. Um, so my journey into coaching, I um, wrestled in high school. Um, my, the college that I went to did not have a wrestling opportunity. And after college, I decided that I wanted to go into education and become a teacher. Um, and after a few years, I actually landed back at my alma mater um, where I went to high school um, and all of the teachers there also coached, so that was kind of easy. Um, and they knew that I had wrestled and that I wanted to get back into wrestling um, if I were to coach. And so I think education is probably a, kind of goes hand in hand with coaching, right? school day ends at three o'clock and then it's pretty easy to get into the to the practice room so if anyone is considering considering going into education i think that really lends itself to um to getting on to the practice mats after school that's awesome i love the smooth transition i always uh, appreciate those teachers who are doing double duty and coaching and staying after making that school day longer so thank you cassie and thank you to all of our teachers out there i know Lori, you're a teacher as well so um, i'm excited <laughs> uh, let's go to monica uh good evening i um did not did not have a smooth transition into coaching that definitely was not ever my plan um uh, you know, after wrestling in college, I did not know what I was going to do with my exercise science degree. Um, I came home and I um, started volunteer coaching just with some middle school girls with um, my that time boyfriend, fiance. Um, he wanted help coaching girls. And and we just kind of started from there when we moved um, and got married and went to Azel. I volunteered coach. We started a girls team there. Um, volunteered for a while. I was offered a job in a different district um, as a head girl, women's coach. And then Azel decided, well, if we're going to keep this family here, we better hire her as a head women's coach. So um, I asked actually if I could be the head women's coach in Azel and they said, well, sure. And that was just kind of like an easy, easy question. I didn't know it would be that easy. And so we just kind of stayed there. Um, during my time in Azel, I coached, um, you know, team Texas did national teams. We kind of gathered kids around Fort Worth area, um, or girls, I guess, and coached them up and helped the coaches around that area who were also new coaches, um, helped them get, get their girls on national team, got them to national tournaments. And we, kind of formed what was pre sisters on the mat at that time, didn't know what we were doing. Um, but we practiced together and at different sites in that area. Um, so, uh, didn't know what was in the future for us. Um, but looking back, it's kind of cool that we've been doing it for so long. Um, and then, so now, um, at the time I've always been teaching and coaching, um, volunteered for probably longer than I've been paid. Um, and now coaching at the middle school, just so that, cause it feeds into the high school that my husband coaches at. Um, that's definitely the hardest job I've ever had is coaching middle school kids. Um, but I think next year we will be full competition mode club as sisters on the mat. We've always just been kind of a, a nonprofit gather up and get on a bus and go. Um, but in Amarillo, we're going to start doing that just to create a safer space for girls here in the area. Um, they, so, um, so we're really looking forward to that next year. <clears throat> I just have to ask before we move on, why would you say that eighth grade is harder, the hardest coaching job that you've had or junior high is the hardest coaching job? Well, they are more like youth because they're new and beginners, but they have no control of their bodies and they're also bigger. <laughs> so they're hard to like, I don't know. And then they've got these strange attitudes and hormones and I don't know. They are just, they, they don't listen as well. <laughs> they, they're definitely a different breed of, human <laughs> for sure 
I always think it's so interesting how like the rest of the world puts like their their like coaches who have like the most amount of experience and patience like with the youngest athletes whereas like we put our our most um experienced coaches with like the older people and I I think it like kind of showcases right like coaching young people and building that base and then like also being patient enough and like having these drills in in the back of your mind like I I just think like it's it's an interesting paradigm in, in the U.S. how we we kind of do it one way whereas the rest of the world does it another but I do think there's a special place in whatever this afterlife is for youth coaches and middle school coaches because after six years it beat the streets I was like whoa <laughs> I like the adults. so thank you Monica yeah. we appreciate it um, I'm going to pass it to Gabby um, to share a little bit of her journey next. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Gabby. Uh, I started wrestling like many of the other ladies who spoke um, when I was very young. I started at four years old, actually. So had a crazy wrestling dad who started me and um, kind of never looked back, you know, through the ages. I grew up and wrestled boys mostly like most of you guys did. And then, you know, had some success in high school and didn't really know um, what was out there. I grew up in Nebraska, so middle of nowhere, um, but didn't really know about college wrestling too much until I, you know, started to get into my junior, senior year uh, of high school. So I was very late to find out about all the opportunities that I had. And uh, thankfully, I ended up at McKendree University, the first year program there. Um, I was actually one of the first girls to sign. So it's pretty fun saying that just because they did become a good powerhouse while while I was there. Um, but yeah, so signed to McKendree University, wrestled there for five years. Um, and then after I was done wrestling, kind of like Monica said, I had this degree and I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, you know, I, I went to McKendree thinking I want to be a dentist, but I focused so much on wrestling and I knew it was going to be hard to go to dental school after I kind of gave up that dream and um, which is good. You know, it ended up being all right for me because I love what I do, but um, I didn't really know what to do. And so I got offered the grad assistant position and I was like, okay, I can do this, waste a little time, continue to train, get another degree. Um, so I did that and I ended up um, sticking around after my grad assistant job just became an assistant coach. So uh, I coached underneath Sam Schmitz for four years, almost five. Um, and then I decided um, when he was you know, ready to make his career move that I needed to make a move as well, which was a very scary time in my life, but um, I chose Southern Oregon, or I guess they chose me, and that is how I ended up in Oregon, so um, it's been fun for sure. It's taken me all over the country, and like I said, you know, growing up in the Midwest, I, I didn't see much, so I didn't move, and uh, I didn't get to the West Coast until I moved to Oregon, so I had never been out here. I drove 32 hours, and went into the mountains and I love it. So uh, yeah, coaching has given me a lot and it's been fun. So I guess that's a little brief, brief um, introduction. What a journey, a decade at a program, basically. That's impressive. I guess my immediate question is like, how was that transition going from immediately co uh, being a student athlete at McKendree to becoming an immediate coach? Yeah, that's difficult. And especially if you stay at the same school, right? Um, because you're around people who are, were your teammates. Um, and so I remember Coach Sam sitting down with me having a very serious talk about how I needed to separate myself um, from the girls right away. And that meant taking my stuff out of the locker room, um, you know, kind of not breaking those friendships, but kind of setting myself apart, like hanging out with different people um, so that I would gain the respect quicker. Um, I was always a little bit different of a student athlete anyways. I, I really just focused on school and wrestling. I was kind of crazy. I didn't, you know, go out and have fun at all, um, which I guess is there's some good and bads. But so I think it was easier for me because because of that, I had already separated myself when I was in school. Um, but it, it did take some time. You know, I couldn't come at it um, at some of those girls like I was in charge of them because I wasn't. It was more like I was the middleman for a long time until all those girls had graduated and left. And then I could finally start feeling like a real coach because it wasn't teammates anymore. Um, so yeah, it was hard. I agree. I remember my transition at USA Wrestling. That was being 21, coaching people who are 24 or, or you know the same age or older than you is, is a big leap. So I think you shared some great advice, how to separate yourself and like being okay with the middleman for the awkwardness. That's awesome. 
Um, while we're waiting for Othella to, to jump back in, we'll, whenever she hops in, we'll have her share her story. I'm going to go ahead and pass to Gabby and Cassie. Let's start with Cassie. Um, what was your pathway to your current role? Um, who were some important decision makers in which you needed to connect with before getting that role? Um, and how did you afford to jump into coaching both full or part-time, whatever kind of situation you're in? Yeah, what I would say, and it sounds like, you know, others on this panel had a similar path, like if you can get a an assistant coaching role, um, so that you can do the fun stuff in the room and not have to worry about all of the administrative stuff on top of it as well that comes with the head coaching role, but like kind of just wet your feet, um, be that, you know, extra drill partner, um, demonstrate in the room. Um, I think that can be a great way to figure out like, A, do I want to do this? Um, and B, and also, also establish yourself in, um, in your in your region um, for for wrestling and for coaching. Um, and I'll just say, um, I like so many people ask me in New England prep wrestling, do you know any of female coaches who might want to come and join our program? Everyone sees the value, um, especially with the girls numbers rising. I get asked all the time. So please email me if you're interested and I can put you in touch with people who are looking for female coaches. Um, and so definitely um stepping into that assistant coaching role i did that for seven years and then when my when the head coach was ready to step down and kind of step away from that he um had been kind of setting me up to take his place and he's still one of my assistant coaches um which was helpful but also um had to navigate that dynamic like okay we don't want anyone to still see me as the head coach and so um, making sure that it was clearly visible that i was the one making the decisions and i was the one um in that role but it certainly helps when you have a coaching staff um, especially if you're starting out if there are other coaches on your staff that you can learn from bounce ideas off of hey Hey, why don't we try this? And uh, actually, no, that's not a great idea because X, Y, Z might happen. Um, you know, it when I first became head coach, I realized like I need my kids to come in a, like an hour before departure to check weight. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, like things like that where you can get like little tidbits from from coaches that have been doing it for a while. And so when you're an assistant coach, you get to kind of see that all happening. Um, and so I would definitely recommend um, if that's a great pathway to to coaching. That's awesome. I love the idea that you stayed there for seven years and then took it over and then the head coach transitioned to be that coach of coaches and also support you. That's really cool. Um, I guess my, my question would be like, what kind of questions did you ask your assistants to kind of empower them to help you? You know, were you comfortable right away asking for help or were you like a little bit nervous once you stepped into that role that you need to fake it or, or anything like that? No, I think especially because I had been there for for seven years and really gained, um, you know, have great relationships with the other coaches on my staff, have great relationships with my with my athletes. And so none of them questioned, like, why is she the one that's taking over this program? Um, and so I think just having a team, I think, you know, wrestling is such an individual sport, but like we we really emphasize the team aspect of it. Um, so having a, a coaching team that we can bounce ideas off of. Um, I always tell my I always tell my athletes, like we go out there and we compete independently, but we can't do any of this without each other. You can't you can only do so much training on your own. Um, and so when your season ends, if you haven't, you know, if you didn't qualify for the next thing, like it is your job to make sure your teammates that did qualify are, are ready for that. And so I, I, we really like lean into the team aspect and I lean into my other coaches as well. Um, and so when I'm thinking about things, I, like I run it by them, like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing, I'm thinking about this. I think this might be our lineup this weekend. What are, what are some holes that I'm missing? What do you guys, what do you guys think? Um, and so I think, you know, never being afraid to, to ask questions. Um, never being afraid to ask for advice, but then also having the confidence that you made the right coaching decision. Um, some people, you know, you might make a decision and maybe it doesn't go the best way. And people will say, why did, why did you do that? Well, because this happened before and I thought that this would be a better route and like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. But I think just not, not, have, not being shy. Um, and I think because I had done this for so long, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to prove myself. Like I did that in the earlier so that now that I'm in this head coaching role, I don't feel like I have to prove myself. I can ask for help. I can ask for advice. I 
love that. I love the coaching team. I love empowering those around you to kind of like bounce things off. But I also love that you have faith in yourself. Like, I think that's been a journey for a lot of us as coaches and even just like as individuals in life and just having that faith that we don't have to be perfect. That's awesome. Um, Gabby, how about you? Who are, um, what was your pathway? And then who were some important decision makers that you needed to connect with um, to jump into a coaching uh, at a full-time or part-time role? Yeah, so I kind of said a little bit about my pathway, right? I was an athlete at McKendree and then uh, took the grad assistant position. Um, it was more selfish reasons at that time that I did that. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I personally wanted to continue to train. I just came off a pretty good athletic season. And so I really did have plans of just taking that role um, almost to be a glorified practice partner, right? Um, you know, yes, have a little bit learned coaching, but I was still selfish, I still wanted to train. I still was practicing every day. Um, I wasn't really running practices or really diving into the coaching at all. I would say my first year, I was more worried about like when I was going to compete and um, on me. And if any of you have ever tried to compete and wrestle and coach, it's nearly impossible in my opinion, um, because, you know, as an athlete, you're very, very selfish. Um, you do everything for yourself. And as a coach, um, all these lazy ladies would tell you, you have to be selfless. You do, you have to be able to kind of jump when someone says jump or, you know, answer your phone all the time, do things you don't want to do. Um, and those were the lessons I started to learn very, very early on um, through experience. And then through Sam, just telling me like, Hey, you got to decide what you want. And those were really, really hard time, a really hard time in my life. I felt like, you know, I would call my mom crying, like saying like, okay, should I give up wrestling to coach or should I, you know, not coach and wrestle and just have to find my own way to do this. And it was a, it was really, really tough um, because I, like I said, I'd wrestled my whole life and I didn't know how to give up something, right? Like the selfish part of me didn't. And so I finally did take that jump just to coach. And, you know, I said, like, I can still wrestle around with the girls, do individuals and get that part of wrestling that I loved, um, but start really trying to learn from, in my opinion, the best person I could uh, learn from. I, I love him to death. Um, and so I really started to dive in trying to figure out you know, how he said things at practice, how he talked to the girls. Um, I tried to, you know, watch him in the backgrounds, the things that people don't see, the recruiting side of it, and, you know, the business side, the budget part of it. And I, I just really started to pay attention. And it, it took me a really long time to um, start figuring things out. But as I started figuring it out, he started to give me little pieces at a time, um, you know, made me run more practices, um, gave me more jobs. And he did it slowly, which I respect. Um, otherwise, I think I would have been very overwhelmed. Um, and so he, you know, Sam, Coach Sam Schmitz really, really helped me in making decisions and things like that. And then I had other people along the way. Um, you know, I had Zach Dominguez in Nebraska, who was my club coach that helped me. Um, and then um, just simply my parents, right? Just like I would rely on them to help me make decisions when I was a kid wrestling. You know, it was the same thing when I was coaching. I, I had to ask, you know, am I doing the right thing? Um, you know, there's times that you're you're going to disagree with the people you're working with. And so that was kind of the the people I vented with uh, to is my parents. And um, yeah, so that was that. And then what was the other question? Um, who did you connect with to uh, get into your role? Who was the important decision makers? And then how did you afford to jump into coaching either full or part time? Uh, well, you never afford it. So if you're going to coach, just make sure you just check that one off. Um, this isn't a business that you're going to make money and you should know that right off the bat. Um, you know, I, I still, I have a great job and yes, I am financially fine, but it's not something you're going to do to make a lot of money right now. Maybe eventually, right. When women's wrestling continues to grow, but right now you really have to do it. Um, just because you love it. When I was an assistant, I was dabbling in everything you could dabble in just trying to make it work because, to be honest, the college did not pay me anything to help out for four or five years that I was there. So, um, you know, I was teaching at McKendry. Um, I got a health care recruiting job that I hated. I was a personal trainer. Um, I worked at Cold Stone, right, sang all the cool songs. So I did everything just to be able to, you know, enjoy wrestling and learn and be around um, and things that didn't take me away too much from what I was trying to accomplish in the end. And so, um, yeah, that's, yeah, you're never going to afford it. So that's the biggest thing I think you should know is like, you have to know why you're doing it because it's never going to be for the money. I love that. I love that you, <laughs> you got to know the why that's so important. Um, what's your why? 
Uh, my why is just because, well, I think your why changes, right? And um, over time, like when I was wrestling and into coaching, it, it's always changed. But the thing that I come back to um, is my why is because wrestling broke the cycle for me. Um, I came from a family that really struggles with mental health, struggles with money, uh, came from a really poor family. And so if I didn't have wrestling, I would have not went to college at all. Um, I wouldn't have you know, lived in Oregon. So wrestling broke the cycle for me. Um, and so now I coach because I want to help break the cycle for other young women. Um, that doesn't always mean the same things like mental health. That could be a drug addiction. That could be a confidence issue, whatever the cycle is that they need to break. Um, that is why I coach. And uh, yeah, I, that's what keeps me coming back. Um, otherwise, after all the crap, and most of you know that we deal with sometimes and the girls just being the way they are, uh, I would have quit if it was just for the love of wrestling, because that's not worth it. But when you come back to that, why uh, it, it keeps you in it a little easier. Thanks, Gabby. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Some wise words. <laughs> well, Bella, before we answer this uh, or ask you this question, do you mind uh, sharing a little bit of your pathway to your, or sorry, oops. Um, what was uh, your journey into coaching? Actually, we just lost her, so I won't ask her that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the next question, I'm going to direct it towards Monica. What were some major internal and external um, obstacles that you found along the way um, or experienced along the way in your journey into coaching and uh, the leadership role that you're in now as a coach and also um, as a CEO? <laughs> um, internal struggles, I think, continue to come back and forth as as I continue to coach and find different roles within the sport, like um, just like self-doubt, self-confidence. I mean, it, it's it's a constant roller coaster within the sport. I, even as you competed or as we competed, um, constantly just wondering if if we belong or if I belong or if if what we're doing, if I'm if what I'm doing is correct or if what I'm doing is right or or if I even have the energy or to keep going, or if, if, I don't know, it's, it's constant. And like, I can see your head shaking. Like, it's just, it's like the imposter syndrome that my friend introduced me to. I didn't know that was a thing, but once, you know, I started learning about it and reading about it, like, yes, it's a thing. And it's, it's, it's a very big thing within, you know, our community and um but it feels good to to research and know that we're all kind of going through it at the same time um you know and then kind of like backing off of what gabby was saying and what what emma was saying about our why like you have to continuously remind yourself of your why and that's what i do with our girls too like they have to write down their why and they always you know like go back to it and we have to know what it is and and just like you guys you know, previously said it changes. And most recently, my my why has changed. Um, you know, my why was always, you know, just for you girls, like, you know, I do it for, you know, to be the change to be what I needed when I was wrestling. And now it's like just creating a safe space, um, creating a safe space, making sure that, you know, they have their own space, and they know how to advocate for themselves. And they can do that for themselves. Like, because it's it, it, but then it also still goes back to what did I not, what did I need when I was in that position, you know? So, and, but, but it's continuous, just, just the roller coaster of the internal struggle is always there throughout, always, right? And like, I just want to be just figuring out what their what the need is in the sport is where um, is where I lead myself, and I think I I know from the outside it looks like I am like headstrong and going all in, but it takes me a long time to figure out like where I'm going to go next. You know, so I mean, like I said earlier, like we've been doing sisters on the mat for a long time, but you know, next year will be the first time that we kind of step on the mats competitively as a club, you know, for that possibility. So like, we just kind of get together and have fun right now, you know, so it's always, you know, barely touching the waters, you know, with me and, um, 
because there is that self-doubt. And then like the external struggles are the same, you know, the harassments and the, um, you know, like people literally telling us that we don't belong, you know, and then, you know, unfortunately the, the verbal harassments, the sexual harassments, the, the things that we don't want to talk about, you know, the things that we probably need to talk about, the things that are uncomfortable, those things, you know, um, unfortunately that, that happen way too often and are coming about and that, you know, that comes back to like, you know, us having to create that safe space for our girls. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing, Monica. That's, I feel like I'm a hundred percent nodding in agreement with you. Um, I think you said some really interesting things, right? Like what the self, uh, the imposter syndrome, and then like knowing that you're having those doubts and then you're coaching women who you see are going through those same kind of moments and struggles for yourself. And I really loved that you said like your why right now is to create a safe space and then to create like the art to empower these women to become advocates for themselves. What are some things that you do to like help them become advocates for themselves to show that like they can speak up against this harassment, speak up against these self doubts. And then how do you role model that as a coach and a leader uh, of sisters on the mat and of Texas women's wrestling, right. To like showcase those things. Like, I know, like I have this, like, I know how people perceive me, right. Like I know how people see me as just like strong and independent and loud mouth sometimes. And I'm going to, you know, but I also know like people tell me things and they expect me to stand up for them. And so I, that makes me feel like, like that is, especially lately, like if they see that in us, then they can see that in themselves. Like if they can tell us something, then that's in them too. If they have the courage to tell one person, then they, they can stand up for themselves. Um, so I don't know. It's hard to set that. I don't know. I don't know how we're setting that example, but I just continuously tell them, even in the practice room, find your space. And to them, I'm sure they're hearing just, okay, I'll get in my circle you know, but I remind them, like, find your space in the classroom, find your space in your, in your world, in your environment, find your space, like, own those words, too, like, we write it in our journals, find our space, what does those mean, like, all the time, um, and then know where your safe space is, and know your limits, and don't be so, like, know your supports team, like, just like we were talking about here, you know, know your supports like system, who's your support system, who do you trust, you know, know those people. Um, we talk about that with my little five-year-olds, with our college girls, like we, we are talking about those things. Um, you know, and I talk to their parents too, like you know who your support, their support system is too, you are them. Um, we just, we're, we're trying to have those conversations, not too hard and not to cross lines of, you know, parents, because that's their job. Um, but I mean, just knowing they need to hear those words, right? Like to start those conversations, or maybe they're going home and asking, what did, what did coach Monica mean by that? Or Mo coach Monica says this, you know, or, you know, and I tell the parents too what I'm saying. And so that they can know, you know, that they, they should say those words too, so that they kind of have an idea and, and just empower. And then I tell them to empower their partners, be good partners, empower them, learn to coach your partner, um, you know, uh, be good coaches, be, and, and things like that to, in their, in their practices, um, because we can't be in every single circle all the time. So oh my gosh, I love those cues. I love own your space and empower your partner. Those are like gold. 
I've got them circled and, <laughs> and arrows pointing to them. I'm definitely going to start using those. I love how it's very like immediate and physical, but I also love that there's a greater meaning where it can go so many different ways and, and really sync, right? Because we've all had those coaches who have said something that's resonated today and it's going to resonate 10 years from now. So thanks for being that coach to those women. I, I'm so happy that they have you in their corner, Monica. Uh, I'm going to bounce it back to Gabby and Monica this time. Uh, we'll start with Gabby. Um, who was your support system along the way for your own ride? Um, and then as a coach, um, how did you let them know that you needed their help? Was there anyone who sparked that idea for you that you belonged in the coaching um, chair? And then who encouraged you and mentored you through that process, right? So who was your support staff as an athlete and, and kind of facilitated that transition into coaching and then um, mentored you through that coaching to really empower you? Yeah, so like I said before, my, my parents, right? Um, they, you know, even though, uh, like I talked about, I came from, um, I want to say rough, but, you know, my life was kind of crazy growing up, uh, even though that it was like that, they were still the most supportive and loving people when it came um, to wrestling and my goals. And so they really helped me um, get to where I am and I, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, and then uh, Coach Sam Schmitz would be the person that I would say has had the biggest impact on my life. Um, he's one of the reasons I decided or he is one of the main reasons I decided to go into uh, coaching just because. Um, he believed in me. And the, the funny thing is we actually hated each other for probably three years of my actual wrestling career. I almost left McKendry a few times and it wasn't because of him. It was because I didn't want to hear the things that he was telling me. Uh, I was a stubborn, stubborn athlete and, you know, I thought I knew everything. And so um, it took a while for our relationship to start to grow. Um, but then once, you know, it did. And then once I started coaching, um, we became more like friends and I could really trust in what he was saying. And he said that he was going to help me become the best woman's coach, you know, ever. And uh, I, I thank him for that because he did. He gave me a lot of confidence and things um, by, you know, the way he encouraged me and motivated me um, and always, you know, was telling me that I could do that. And so uh, he was definitely the person who really helped me you know, and still helps me out. Like even this past weekend at the U.S. Open, you know, he, he's the one I'm calling in in the hotel room after the tournament, you know, talking and um, whether that's good things or bad things or, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Like, what do you think? Um, and so he's the person I still lean on a lot. Um, and that's why I think it's so important. And this is just a little piece I want to throw in that we don't push out men in our sport. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, obviously like calls like this, we want to empower women, which is great. Um, I'm all about it, obviously, but um, our sport, if we like it or not, it, it did start with men. And so the men are the ones that we have to learn from. Um, and if you get under good men, a lot of times, you know, you're going to learn everything you knew, need to know about, you know, the wrestling knowledge, maybe how to um, build a team and then you can add the woman twist on it. Right. And the woman twist is what makes us so special. Um, it's not that the men coaches are any less than us, but I think it definitely helps. Um, so those are my supporters. And then now, you know, as a head coach, it's a different role. Um, I definitely have my assistants that I lean on a lot. Um, I have loved this head role because now I can start doing for others what Sam did for me. Um, I can start trying to build up new coaches, right? Whether that's they want to coach part-time or they want to become a, you know, a head woman's coach at the college level someday or own a club. Um, I can just start teaching them the little, the bits that things that uh, coach Sam taught me. And, you know, one of those things is like, what we do is 10% wrestling. So you have to be ready to, you know, deal with all aspects of life. Um, and so I would say them. And then the last person I'd like to say is probably um, one of my athletes, which is a weird um, scenario, but she is the oldest woman wrestler um, in college right now, or was uh, Natalie Rayner. She, Raina, she was 31 years old as she finished. Um, we def definitely had a different relationship. So I started with her at McKendry and coach Sam gave me her as a job, basically like, Hey, she's all yours, right? As my first year coaching, she, she came to us as she was 26 years old and she did not know how to wrestle very well. Um, and so that was my job. And, you know, I started to help her and work with her and, you know, wrestle with her and individuals and things. But because she was older than me, she had a lot of um, life wisdom that I didn't have. And so she's a person that I leaned on 
constantly um, when I didn't understand maybe why kids act the way they do or things like that, just because I was a little different. Um, she was the person that was able to, you know, talk wisdom into me um, so that I could minister to these girls in the right way without being like angry because I didn't understand. Um, and then when I came to SOU, um, her, Joy Levendusky and Grace Kristoff followed me here and um, have continued to give me that support, right? They believe in me. And so anytime that I doubted myself or for example, like after um, world team trials, right? Juniors, we just didn't compete like how I wanted to. And I was like, man, guys, like, I feel like I didn't prepare them like I should, right? Like I feel um, like I should have done something differently. And they were first to say like, hey, no, you know, like we, you did exactly what you're supposed to do. They're young. And so they give me that confidence and that support when I need it, um, even as athletes, which I think um, is different, but it's much needed on my part, especially being a young coach. I think a lot of times we think feedback goes one way right as the coach we can only gather feedback laterally or, or above and like the ability to have that feedback coming from below and pushing up is super helpful and rewarding at the same time it kind of gives you that reassurance because some sometimes you're getting feedback from people who aren't spending every day with you so I'm glad right. that you have people in the room who are physically there Albus just made an appearance um, <laughs> to give feedback um, how about you um, Monica who was your support system along the way um, so like as an athlete, I started late. I started my senior year of high school and made it, you know, to college. And so I didn't rely a lot on coaches. We were in between coaches in college. And so my teammates were like the best thing I had. I had some really good wrestlers in the room at Missouri Valley. We, they coached us up, um, you know, and, and so we had a really good experience that way. Um, and, but then, you know, once I stopped wrestling for a little bit and got kind of pulled into coaching, my husband was the one who did that for me. And I was pretty resistant at first. And um, he just kind of saw something or I don't know, just needed the help and, and pulled me in and started there. And he's been the biggest support system. He's, he's, he's the one that, you know, lured, lured me in and, and we kind of back each other up a whole, whole lot. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, ran in the very, very beginning, I did a camp um, in, in Dallas and it was Marcy Van Dusen. I can't even think of her married name right now. Um, Randy Miller and Takara Montgomery. And they all came after the 2008 Olympics and did a camp in Texas. And I just became really good friends with Randy and Marcy. And I think that they mentored me um, a lot after that. And I think that's when I really like pulled in a lot of things from them. I did, I went to camps at OTC and I did went to a camp in California with Marcy uh, when she was a coach at Menlo. And I just learned a whole lot from those aspects and, and, and a lot of just like, not even just the coaching, like wrestling part of everything, but the journaling and the nutrition and the, and all the psychology part of it. And that's what really like interest, interested me more in coaching side of everything. And then, um, you know, my good friend Daphne Cedeno now, um, she probably supports me uh, the most next to my husband and, you know, um, a coach that I kind of recruited in that I coached from Team Texas, Shelby Morrison. She's leading off our sisters on the mat in Oklahoma. Um, you know, depending on, on what I'm needing or what kind of support I need is who I go to and what, and what I, uh, what I'm kind of struggling with. And, you know, like if, if I really need to gripe it's Shelby, you know, cause she's the one who can just like, you know, gripe back with me or, you know, if I need feedback or advice, or if I think somebody's gone through it already, you know, Chris is the one who can like give me the facts or fix it. He's, he's Mr. Fix it, you know, and then, and then Daphne's the one who will help me kind of figure out what they're thinking or what's going on um, and kind of speak to me and, and calm me down. Um, so, you know, and then of course, always my parents are, are just kind of have always been there just, you know, the proud, proud Papa who, who wrestled in high school, who just begged me to wrestle forever. And I was like, Oh heck no, I'm never going to do it until, you know, way later. Um, 
And then, you know, my mom who loves it, but never admitted to it and loves seeing the boys doing it. Um, you know, so it was always kind of rough when I was actually wrestling, but now coaching is, is kind of cool seeing, seeing the support come in and, you know, random coaches that come up and, and love, you know, seeing what we're all doing through the sport. And, and, and I love the support from, from the male coaches that we get. Um, and then them wanting us to involve their girls and, and then them wanting to be involved as well is it's super cool. That's awesome. I love that both of you said you had someone who kind of planted that seed and fought for it and, and made a space for you and planted that you're going to be the best coach or like you're going to, you should be on the mat every day with me. Right. And continually combating that imposter syndrome that we all feel. And then I also love Monica that you brought up, right. My support system is not all the same. I need to know who I need or what I want to hear. <laughs> Do I want someone who's going to listen and vent with me? Do I want someone who's going to boost me up? Do I want a solution to this problem? Right. We all need to, to think about like, who are we asking for help and when, and, and uh, really utilize our resources the best. Oh, Stella, thanks for jumping on before we bump to this question. We would love to hear your journey. <laughs> My journey to making this Zoom meeting or <laughs> that was <a> journey. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. What's your journey yeah, in coaching? <laughs> um, so my former teammate, I was on WCAP, uh, my former teammate and his brother had a club team. And they it was like um the little guys, so like four years, four years old to like the high school age. Um, they asked me to come out and, and coach. So, and it was during the time when I thought I was done wrestling in, in 2013. Um, so I like jumped on it. I was like, all right, I'll come out and coach. But then I started competing again in 2015. So that coaching um, experience was short-lived. Um, so then I started competing again. Um, and then I stopped for real that time. And um, Puts, he was, he was a D1 coach and then he coached um, for the army. Um, and then he also has two um, athletes in the UFC that he coaches. So he coaches at Fountain Fort Carson. He's the head coach there. And he asked me to be the girls coach. Um, and I said, yes, cause I miss wrestling so much. And um, so they're like, just come out and coach, come out and coach. So I did, and I finished my third season there. Um, so, um, yeah, that's about it. I've, I was asked to consider coaching college, but, um, at the, especially at the time, I just felt like I wasn't developed enough as a coach. Um, so it was good for me to, to be under Kutz. He, to me, he's a, he's a mad technician. He has so much technique. I grab him, um, before and after practice and, and freshen up on things or ask him to show me stuff. So, um, and just kind of taking the back seat, like, even though I'm, I'm still the, the girls head coach, coaching under him, I think um, it's given me the opportunity to really like learn and develop and, and um, just get ready to go to the next level. Cause I know like at that time and still right now, I don't think I'm ready for the, for the college scene. <laughs> So that's what, where I'm What makes you think that you're not ready? Um, it, it requires a lot of time. And right now, like, um, I have a full-time job jumping in. Luckily, like with high school, there's actual seasons. So um, it's just four months out of the year, just getting up at four o'clock in the morning, going to, go to these tournaments on the weekends. Like, it's, it's a lot. And then dealing with the parents and <laughs> so that's another area that I'm I'm just I'm just working on um not taking everything personal um keeping a level head just being patient with um the athletes and their families and um yeah it's all just it's all learning I'm I'm not saying like it won't be very soon before I can and jump into the college scene but I, I'm well, of, well aware of um, my, my room for growth. So, and I'm having fun because it's only four, four months I look forward to the season. <laughs> well, I think, um, 
I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like you're ready to make that leap. I thought you were ready to make that leap a while ago, but I'm excited for you. And I'm glad that you're feeling empowered and, and excited. I think uh, you talk about like a really good point, right? Time is a real consideration, right? You, we're not, as Gabby said, we're not in coaching to, to pay the bills. We're in the <laughs> in coaching for our why. And so, um, you know, that is an, an actual constraint and being able to like juggle those things to pay those bills and, and take care of yourself. Those are really important, but we are excited for that next step, old fella. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to jump into well, that's an- volunteering at the camps. Mm-hmm. That's, I'm like, oh, it's like pulling me in. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who don't know, there's a USA Wrestling Team, uh, team USA Selection Portal, and you can um, submit your name to be a volunteer coach. Um, and those are selected by the Women's Sports Committee. Um, it comes once a year in August, and it's a great way to start building that confidence. So if you are a high school coach who wants to jump in and, and try and help those U15 and U17 girls, if you're a college coach who wants to start working with those U17 and U20 girls, entering your name into that portal and volunteering at camps is a great way to, to build your resume and also to just gain experience. And that is all can be found on Team USA um, coach selection and into yourself there. So I think it's a great way for each of us to learn. I think Gabby's mentioned it and I think uh, Othello also mentioned it too. So um, take advantage of that. Um, this next question is for Cassie and Othello. Who helped you build confidence in your ability to coach and what resources have helped you develop as a coach? Gabby, you wanna go first or me? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Cassie, that one's for you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. You're next, Othello. Get yeah, ready. Yeah, sure. Othello, why don't, why don't you go first? Um, let's see. Building confidence, I have to mention Takara. Like, even when, when we were teammates, um, Takara Montgomery, I know, I know Monica mentioned her earlier, but I, I call her all the time, and I lean on her heavily. Um, and... I, and I let them know by uh, start just getting more comfortable asking for help. I have learned that during my coaching experience. I didn't have that as an athlete. I, people just came over to me like, that girl needs help. <laughs> but as a coach, I find it difficult to just to reach out and be like, listen, like I need help. Um, so I do, I do reach out to my former teammates, um, Takara, um, She'd helped me build confidence. Um, Jessica Medina, I call her and she prays with me. Um, and who else? Who else? Oh, um, uh, Tim. He was the Olympic alternate what, back when uh, Byers was competing. Uh, so the, our, our army heavyweight. He's like, listen, like you could do it. Come on, girl. So um, yeah, just like my former teammates mostly. And I, I lean on them heavily. <laughs> I love that you forge those connections and still use them. I think we all talk about how wrestling has like forged those relationships in our life and like how valuable they are. But if we only use them for like that social side, we're really missing out because I think there's some empowerment, but also some shared knowledge that we can all utilize. Absolutely. Um, how about you, Cassie? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned previously, um, I was an assistant coach under my head coach, um, who was actually my coach when I was in high school. So I had that relationship as his, you know, I was his athlete and then I was his assistant coach and then, um, took over from him as head coach. And so he's been certainly a huge mentor in my development as a wrestler and as a coach. Um, and then as a, you know, high school teacher and a high school coach and all of the teachers here coach, I really lean on the, female coaches for other sports as well who have been coaching, you know, women's soccer, women's field hockey, hockey, um, just because I think, um, you know, it is different um, in athletics being a a woman's coach, whether or not we're coaching a woman's team or um, a boy's team. And so just really leaning leaning on them. And in high school, I think we're we're not just developing athletes, we're doing developing, you know, we're development, helping them develop into, you know, humans, <laughs> um, good humans, I hope, you know, we want them to go off into the world and do good. And so um, I think just really relying on the other women in my life who are in similar roles and and asking them questions, how would they deal with the situation, um, I think um, has been really, you know, invaluable to my growth as a coach. 
I love that. I love leaning on our peers. I think it's so underrated. Um, I think sometimes we're looking for a magic solution when we just need to, to lean on one another. Um, this next question is for Monica and, and um, Cassie again. Uh, what, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I meant to put Gabby here. I'm gonna put Gabby. What can other women do to make space for new women in coaching? And then what do you do currently to involve other women in your coaching circle? I think both of you guys have talked about peers in the past too and the importance of them. So let's start with uh, Othella and then we'll move to Gabby. You're muted, buddy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was saying that I haven't done a very good job at this, um, but I just just going to tournaments and um, connecting with the other female coaches and just talking to them. Um, I mean, that's that's the only real real time I have, you know, connections with them. But um, I do need to get better at that because it does help. I'm learning. <laughs> How about you, Gabby? I think just um, for me, you know, this year was nice because I had. Um, two women on staff with me. They were my assistants, Anicia Ramirez and um, Olivia Pisano. So um, with them, you know, it was nice just having them underneath me and asking them constantly, like what I can do to help them or like where they wanted to take their own career, right? Because some people are in wrestling as coaching just to, you know, they're fine with just being an assistant for the rest of, you know, time being, or maybe they do want to eventually be a head coach, or maybe they want to start a club or whatever that might be. And so um, I really just kind of like to involve them by asking them first, like, what is your end goal, right? And then I can start deciding like what the best um, opportunities is that I can give them, whether that's okay, maybe they want to do more of the recruiting side because they are going to be a head coach and it's good to see the difficulties in that or say that, you know, they're okay with being an assistant, then you kind of guide them and teach them other things. Um, and so that's kind of, the only experience I've really had with, you know, bringing women into my circle, um, I'm starting to get better at, at it as well. Um, you know, there's a few people that when I go to tournaments now, I'm, you know, comfortable to say hi or whatever. Um, at first, I think I was intimidated. I just stayed in my bubble. But um, now, you know, after doing it for a while, I can say hi to other women and it doesn't feel like we're fighting each other like the girls are on the mat. It's more of just like, hey, I'm trying to grow this together. Um, and so, yeah, like um, Estella said, I'm still trying to you know, learn and um, figure out the best way to bring bring women all together in our sport and in the coaching role. I love that. It really just starts with saying hi. It's a real uh, <laughs> de-escalation of, of a combative sport. Because we're doing great on time, I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Cassie and Monica to go ahead and answer this question too. Um, so I, I wish that I would run into other female coaches. I really don't get the opportunity to do that all that often. Um, and when I do, I will go like to their corner and wait till they're done coaching and then introduce myself because I get really excited. Um, and so as kind of the only female coach in my, um, like association in my athletic association, um, every year when we host, I host a, um, girls tournament. Um, so in case it wasn't clear, I coach a boys, like a mixed gender team. Um, so, um, and we have girls on the team and the number of our girls have, has grown steadily over the years. And so when I first started coaching, maybe had one or two, and now we have 20 girls on the team. Um, and so I started a girls wrestling tournament because I wanted the girls to feel like they had um, an event to look forward to that was going to be just for them and every year i've brought in um, some amazing clinicians so that they can see other role models um, in our sport so jackie davis has was a clinician for us um, for one of the tournaments that we did um, i've had elena pirashkova come lee janes come Catherine shy was our clinician this year and so i think it's just really important for um, our younger athletes to see um, women who have been successful in our sport um, and can see maybe what they 
they can aspire to if they want to wrestle at the college level or um, beyond um, and, and, to, and to have that role model. And then I know our sport's a combat sport, but I am all about fostering community. The women's wrestling community is really small. I think most of us knew each other before, you know, knew um, some of each other before joining the panel. And um, it's very different than the boys wrestling. Like the girls will get the sna their Snapchats and Instagrams like after matches and we'll stay in touch with one, one another. And while I'm actively coaching my own wrestlers like at a tournament, like when my kids aren't wrestling, I'm co I'm like cheering on the other girls. And I think it's just so important that we're supporting um, supporting all the girls because I think what, what we're all doing is, is really brave. Um, and um, inspiring. And so I want them, I just, I want this to be, a place that all girls regardless if they're wrestling for me like feel like they have a place and feel like they want to come back to because hopefully they will be the future coaches um that we get really excited to see at those events so not making trying to make space for all the all the female wrestlers um haven't come into any coaches yet but hopefully they'll one day step into those roles i love that thank you cassie i love the supporting other women regardless of which team they're on and encouraging your women to stay in touch i think sometimes we're the gatekeepers of our own sport whether we're in the coaching role or we're athletes but like how do we make it a more welcoming space for everyone instead of um, having them prove their worth or or creating that barrier um, how about you monica um so with i'm in a really cool space in t within Texas since because we've been wrestling since 1999. Um, so we've got girls who, you know, have been through the sport already forever ago. So when I run into girls or like athletes that I know, and I've been coaching here for 15 years and they're graduated high school or, or going through college, like I always invite them to come into the room. And so and if they're interested or they miss the sport or whatever, they start coming in and they'll they'll start, you know, mentoring the girls or coaching with the girl, coaching the girls. And then I kind of watch and see what they would like their role to be. And sometimes they they start coaching alongside me or, you know, they may may just kind of like to hang out or maybe they they've actually started bringing their daughters and which makes me feel super old. But, you know, here we are. <laughs> um, but I've actually, you know, in my room right now, I've I've got about six to eight other females that I've either coached or my husband's coached or, you know, that they're, that are bringing their daughters in that have already wrestled. So it's kind of cool. We almost have like an all female staff, you know, and then we have some guys popping in and out to coach and just bringing in, like, if I ever find out that you wrestled once, like you're going to come to practice. I know. And I, I kind of, harass them, <laughs> unfortunately, to see if they'll, they'll come. And, and it's just kind of an environment that we like to create. And then, you know, being able to have sisters in different areas around Texas and in Oklahoma, you know, people have kind of started wanting to be involved in it. And, um, you know, just bringing them, pulling people in from colleges. And then when I did Team Texas, you know, we pulled in college girls to help coach. And I know that other national teams do the same thing, um, you know, and they love, love to do that kind of stuff. And so we continue to do that, kind of bringing the college girls back and then putting them in charge of things. You know, they don't always volunteer, but say, hey, can you, can you do this? Are you comfortable doing this? And then figuring out like, I think maybe um, maybe it was Gabby that said, you know, finding their role, like what are they comfortable doing? And then saying, okay, that is exactly what you're doing. And it may not even be anything in the wrestling room or, you know, whatever, but it may be just checking, doing room checks or, you know, whatever it is, but then having a certain role that they can take on. And, and then it just grows and grows from there. Um, yeah. And is creating camaraderie at tournaments and creating, um, uh, you know, and then making friends with the kids' moms and, and even their, the girls that you see come and join your little girl groups and they're coming in and out and then, you know, introducing them to their coaches. And, um, and I'm always inviting, you know, um, you know, their coaches to on our trips and, you know, things like that so that the girls feel safe, you know, cause their coach is there um you know and and just setting that that kind of tone so that we can have more girls joining and coming in coming in on on those experiences and and that way we're all unified and um so like 
I don't know, but, but like they said, like creating those roles for everybody and knowing where they feel strongest. And, but I do, you know, like really pull them in and, um, but we're in a good place, you know, like just because everybody, like we have a lot of support, like, especially in Amarillo, like I can find people like, oh, hey, you wrestled, come here, I need your help. And they love to help. They love, and then especially when I have really little ones, like, oh, you like the little ones? Yes, for sure. You go with the little ones and they'll take them on. So <clears throat> that's awesome. I love that you're pulling people in, whether they have wrestling experience, whether they're a mom and like finding roles to fit them. And I love that you're doing that in your peer mentorship with um, the high school girls who are matriculating up from your youth program and the college girls who have matriculated up past, past that. And I think that's uh, uh, honestly like a super effective way. There's tons of research on it, but also like it's the best way to save yourself from having to hold up all of this entire ship, but also like creating that strong bond that keeps people coming back day after day after day. And that really elevates your community over time. And it's super cool that you have moms coming back who wrestled for you, who are now bringing in their kids. That's full circle. That's next level. Um, this next question again is going to be for everyone and then we'll bump into the chat um, and start answering some of these questions. So if you are an audience member and you've been waiting for your moment, now's the time to get those uh, hands ready to type in the chat what kind of questions you'd like us to ask. Um, while you're doing that, I'm going to have these guys answer um, what are one or two uh, uh, your coaching nuggets of wisdom that you would like to share with a new coach or that you would tell your younger self um, that would potentially make a huge difference. So, um, let's start with Cassie. Um, and kind of having seen some of the comments or, or, or questions that are in the chat, I would say, um, and going back to, you know, Gabby's point of like figuring out the why, um, why we do this, obviously we all love the sport of wrestling, but I would say, um, at least this is easier to do at the high school level. I know there's more pressure at the college level, but really focusing on, you know, on the, the, the athlete, um, winning's great. We all love winning, um, but focusing on their development as a person. And that's gonna, what, that's, what's gonna keep them coming back, right? Wrestling is such a tough and grueling sport. Um, and it can be easy to, for people to think like, why am I doing this? Why do I put myself through this? Why do I put my body through this? Um, it's mentally exhausting, um, physically exhausting. And so if we can really focus on, um, the individual's and that's what's going to draw other people as well. So if your question is like, how can I get more girls to draw the sport? If you can build that culture where we're just really supporting one another and we care first about the athlete and we're going to teach you the skills um, that you will use to win and we'll help you reach your goals. But first and foremost, it's about the um, building them into um you know, the humans that we want to see out in the world. And I think that's what's gonna that's what's gonna draw people into our sport and keep them there. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, I think that's an underrated part of our sport, right? We're hopefully not just developing great wrestlers, we're developing good people who want to make this world a better place and hopefully want to give back to others down the road for all the great things that you gave them. So sorry to not have listed a second person to go, um, but Gabby looks enthralled. So I'll go to her and then I'll go Monica and then uh, Othella. Uh, so I would say the two things that I would give it as advice or I guess a, a nugget. Um, one I already mentioned and then Cassie just mentioned it again is, you know, really know your why. Um, and you need to know your why. And then you also need to, you know, make your athletes say their why. Um, so for me, I always pick one day out of the year. Um, I guess this is my first time around as a head coach. I said to say always, but as at McKendree, as assistant, we did this too. pick one day, you know, where you feel like everyone really needs it. Um, maybe it's because people are feeling burnt out or, you know, the season's really just starting to wear on them emotionally, things like that. And, you know, don't practice that day, sit them down and just talk right, about your why, and you'll, you'll find out that it gets very emotional for a lot of people, right, and don't, don't let your athletes just say, because I love it, right, because that's not a true why, um, because we all love wrestling to some extent, some more than others, obviously, um, but I always say when, like, you know, crap hits the fan, right, and you don't want to go back to practice, like, what makes you walk through that door, like, what is your why, and I, I think 
um, doing that for yourself and then having the athletes do that is super important. Um, I've had to come back to that a couple of times this year because, you know, I get so focused on winning. I am one of those people, Cassie, is I, you know, I love to win and um, I just felt a lot of pressure to win this year. And so I had to come back to my why a lot of, hey, why are you actually doing this? It has nothing to do with the, the winning, right? Even if you don't win, people are still going to love you and be happy for what you're doing at that school. And so that's important. And then the second one um, is know your coaching philosophy and don't, don't sway from it. And so this took me some time to learn. Um, I started learning it as assistant because people would ask coach Sam, like recruits, like what's your coaching philosophy? And I was always like, that is such a dorky question. Like that is lame. Like, what does that even mean? Um, but then I started realizing like how important it is. Right. And, you know, I don't know if, a lot of coaches get that, but I get that quite often from parents and from um, recruits. And so I, I think it's important because it, you know, it gives them an idea of what you're about and it gives yourself an idea of what you're about so that you don't sway away from it. And so, for example, mine, when people ask me what your coaching philosophy is, I always say I'm very relationship based. And um, I mean that because, you know, through wrestling, what I've learned from having coach and coach and watching different coaches is like, not every athlete can be treated the same, right? Not every athlete can be coached the same. And so I always say, you guys all come to me with different baggage, right? And so I have to make a relationship with each one of these athletes to understand, like, how do I truly motivate them? How do I really get them to turn on? And like, what really turns them off and turns them away from me? And after you do that, then you truly, the athlete will start trusting you and you'll learn how to really, um, you know, get to them and mentor them. Um, and so that would be my two nuggets um, of advice. Thanks. Thanks, Gabby. I agree. I think until you spend a lot of time digging into that coaching philosophy, it can be hard to make those tough decisions and figure out what you're going to do in those relationships, right? Who are you going to be and how are you going to show up for those girls every single day? Um, it's hugely impactful. How about you, Monica? Well, I loved what they said and I can back off, like I can like go off of what they said a lot. Um, so I was taking, I was like, had to mark off my list as they spoke. Um, but um, one big thing is like surround yourself by like-minded people. That's not like to, to not be around the people that don't believe the same way you do. But um, I have been burnt by those types of relationships too. So just, you know, within the circle that you keep, you know, keeping those like-minded people that support you and so your support staff, um, support team, you know, and under, but also, you know, understanding or trying to understand or keeping someone there with you to, that helps you understand where other people are coming from um, by keeping like that open mind. I know like in the, in the heat of things, like sometimes your mind isn't, isn't right, you know, but, but getting to that place. Um, and then, um, and just kind of knowing where they're coming from, even if it's not the same place you're coming from. Um, we all have like different coaching philosophies, different, different styles, different egos, different things going on. Um, but just kind of, just kind of understanding all of that. Um, and, and do, and also knowing that people do change. I've watched people evolve through this sport and through our community, um, that I didn't think could or would, and I didn't put my faith in, in those people. And, and, you know, I have watched them change and evolve and, and we, people here on this zoom and people, you know, in the community were part of that change. And, um, and I think that that's really cool and they can be part of, of our, our, of our circle and our, and our support staff and our part support team. Um, so, but it, but it is very important that, you know, like your, your like-minded people are there for you and, um, and keeping them close and, and then, you know, but, like I said, I loved what everybody had said, you know, like making relationships with your, with your teams, you coach each individual, you know, um, you can communicate your why all the time, your why changes. And then, you know, something with me, like creating safe space for everyone that that's my new why. So that's something that's really strong with me right now. Um, so, you know, be what you needed when you were younger, all of those little things, those tidbits, you know, like, and maybe that's because I'm working with a younger group of girls 
you know, and not as intense as when I was working with, you know, like high school or national team stuff. But um, so, so yeah, these are my nuggets. I love it. I love that you have to have a coach who like believes in what you see and believes in your plan, but also can like give that outside perspective because you're right in the heat of the moment, things do get real and you're like seeing it your way. And then this person's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Everything's okay. And then we'll talk. Um, and I also love the being what you want to be, be the person you wanted and needed when you were younger. Cause I think we all know, um, or have had those experiences with coaches who maybe you didn't feel that relationship with or, or didn't feel that safe space. So that's super important. Um, Othella, how about you? What are some of your, your coaching nuggets of wisdom or something you would tell a younger version of yourself as a coach? I would say, um, getting to know your athlete and their goals. Um, and then um, just observing, like really paying attention to what they need um, because they might not always verbalize it. So just paying attention, especially like in the room um, when, when they're going live, for example, and you're just like in their ear. Some people don't respond well to that. Maybe just sit back and take notes and, and pull them aside later. Um, and some people do like to be coached and yelled at. So, um, but just knowing what they need in, in the room prior to competition, because um, you don't wanna be one way as a coach and then all of a sudden another way during competition, right? So just giving them what they need and being observant um, and learning from the individual athlete because not everybody wants to be coached the same. Um, and so, um, I think those two things, and then just know, by knowing your athlete and their goals, you're you're focusing on just making sure that you're providing what they need as a coach. So those those are my two, um, and I kind of I, I go to that because, um, especially like in the developmental stage of of wrestling, like you don't want to just assume everybody wants to go to college or make an Olympic team or make a world team. So you're spending time, um, you're spending a lot of time on them, focusing on developing them and just, you might, you, you may be doing too much. Um, I've had a, someone tell me like, oh, you're, you're being really hard on me. And I'm like, oh, so you, you don't want to win? <laughs> like, so um, it's just like, um, like I said, just being observant and knowing and listening to your athletes, seeing what they need. Uh, and there's also, there's also those, those wrestlers who they are there because they don't have the best family dynamic and wrestling is their outlet and, and it's fun for them. And they don't necessarily um, have the goal of college. So um, just to, uh, you know, backing off a little bit and allowing them to have this as a safe space and, keep wrestling fun. So, cause why do it if it's not fun, honestly? <laughs> so, um, and you're reminded of that when you don't, you know, reach your goals, when you're not always winning. So I'm um, just knowing that as a coach, knowing that like um, which, of, which of these athletes have that goal of making an Olympic team, which one of these, which of these athletes have like, they say they want a certain number of wins. So just everyone's, everyone has, um, has a different objective um, of why they're competing and just knowing that is going to help you provide what they need. I love it. I love it. You got to get to know your athletes and know their why you got to know what their goals are and how they want to be coached. Right. Because right. none of them are the same. And, and when we make assumptions, <laughs> it usually doesn't go so well. So yeah. you know, we want to be smart with our time and also with theirs and, and to build that relationship, it takes knowing them. So these are great nuggets. I'm going to redirect to the questions in the chat um, for this. Uh, one or two of you guys can answer each question because I think we have quite a few. Um, but I'm going to just read the question and whoever feels good about it um, can, can go ahead and answer. So first question is, how did you decide on a mentor? Was it formal or organic um, in its origin? How long will I let the awkward pause remain? I've already ended it. 
Any takers? I didn't, um, let's see, I didn't really decide on a mentor. I just kind of, I just started calling people like, listen, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna hear what I have to say and I'm gonna ask for your help <laughs> because you've done this for a long time. And, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it went for me. Um, and just, I guess being comfortable enough to, to know when to ask for help and just being vulnerable too. Um, because just knowing that like I have a lot to learn so and and being open to the criticism too so I've been I've been pulled aside during practice before and so but that's that's how we grow and that's how that's how I'm going to be a better coach so feedback's a gift anyone else before we ask the next question I think for me um it was people just took me under their wing uh, I was young and they could see I really wanted to do this. And so they actually reached out to me. For me, it was always hard to ask for help. Um, I wasn't the person calling and, you know, saying, hey, I need help. Um, I just quietly, I guess, suffered when I did need help. So for the people who just put me under their wing, I'm very thankful for. And those are people, too, that I think seen me at my worst, but also knew me at my best. And I think those are great mentors because, you know, you, you know that they're going to love you um, even when maybe you don't succeed um, and they're going to just continue to help you. It's not always like just for them, right? So the satisfaction of like, oh, I helped that person. It's more of like, even if you don't do good, they're still going to be there. And so, yeah, that's how mine kind of happened or how they helped me. I love it. It happens both ways, right? It happens organically, but also by by making that phone call. And so it depends on where you're at. And um how willing are you to be Othella and make that phone call? Uh, next question, how do you push your women in practice um, to challenge them, but also not injure them? And how do you juggle that kind of fine line? I think you can tell a lot by someone's body language. Um, you know, if you have an athlete that's consistently running sprints and they're always in, in, you know, in first and for a week, they're like just struggling. You can kind of see that they might need some time off or just back off a little bit. Um, maybe do some, some mental training exercises instead or like some mindset exercises instead, like just finding different ways or some cross training, they might be getting burnt out or close to injury, especially during those big competitions, like um, towards the end of the season for, you know, for uh, my athletes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pressing time for them and just, just paying attention, really. That's the biggest thing. And you'll, you'll be able to tell when they give them a little break back off. We used to have a, um, a sports scientist look over our periodization plans at USA Wrestling before the start of each year. Um, and then throughout the season, and we would, you know, check in where we were. And uh, from the start of the season to the end of the season, uh, this um, scientist and, and would always just tell us like, less is more. And I think we're so used to hearing like we have to grind to win um, that we grind ourselves into the ground instead of recognizing there's there's physical challenges, there are mental challenges, there's community building challenges, there's technique challenges and tactic challenges, watching film and asking them to kind of like pick those things out. But recognizing that not all of our challenges need to physically be exhausting in order to succeed. Um, does anyone else want to share? Yeah, I think Othella like hit the nail on the head in terms of like you get to know your athletes and you get to you get to recognize like when they when they seem like they they might be off and might need a break. Um, but also sometimes I give my athletes the choice. You know, if we're doing a couple of live um, wrestling rounds and then I say, okay, we're gonna do two more rounds. Like, but listen to your body. If your body's telling you like you're done for you're done live wrestling for today, that's okay. You can sit yourself out in your stretch. If you feel great and you're ready to go and you're energized for two more rounds like you should do that and so I think giving giving um, our athletes the choice um, and also teaching them how to 
how to listen to their body, what to look for. Like, am I hurt or am I sore? Um, am I just tired? Like, can I mentally push myself through this? Um, I think that's all kind of can be incorporated into your practice plans um, as well. Well, that's gold, Cassie. That's gold. Comes back to, right? Like empowering our athletes to make decisions for themselves and become an advocate. Um, the next question, how do you grow opportunities for women in sport, um, i.e. adding a Greco division to women in your area or helping grow college programs or growing women in your local clubs? Um, so you have to provide those opportunities because nobody's going to do that for you. I, I've feel like um really you just see people doing it you you have to find the space you have to you have to take your girls there like you have to like if you want like I've always said if you want bigger tournaments you have to go to them like if you want you want more girls to wrestle um you have to be there like we had a problem with you know, having bigger girls divisions, but then our, our best girls wouldn't wrestle in the girls division because they didn't have the competition. So they would only wrestle in the boys. Well, if you want bigger girls competitions and you have to join the girls comp divisions, now we have to continue to grow them. So, you know, if, if that's what you want, you have to, you have to be part of the growth. You have to, you have to be the leader. Um, whatever it is that you want, you have to go for it. You have to, you have to do those things. Um, you know, like you can't just wish it, wish it, we have to do it. Um, so, and that's the hard part, you know, that's the tiring part. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's the burnout part, you know? Um, but then you just, you just take a breath and you get your third win and you just keep going because I mean, that's, that's all you can do. Right. Because, because when you quit, who's going to do it? Like, that's kind of what I was thinking about today. If, if I stop, who's going to do it? Who's going to follow? So you just have to keep going, right? Like there's no, like, you just have to keep going. You have to do it. If you, if, if, if that's what you want, if you see the need, then you just have to do it. You have to find a way you find your support team. You find the people who feel the same way and you just go. <clears throat> That was awesome, Monica. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I do agree that we all have to like step up and it sucks. And it, I'm sorry that it comes down to us just grind, grinding. Um, but hopefully, you know, with a few more years and maybe a decade, um, we'll be able to, you know, like catch our breath because somebody else will be running beside us um, in each of our local areas. I think we have a lot of people who are running right now, but maybe we're not all in the same region or, or community that uh, we can kind of lean on each other. And hopefully that's the growth we're going to take. Um, this next question is, is mainly for Gabby, um, but it's also for all of you. So if there are women out there interviewing um, at the college level, what kinds of questions should they be asking the administrators of, of the university or high school or wherever it is that they're applying? Um, and what did um, you ask? And then also, what do you wish you would have asked them? That's a good question. Um, so, you know, I kind of got help from a mentor before going into my interviews and things like that on what to ask. Um, otherwise I would have had no idea. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that it comes down to, especially at the college level, uh, is you're looking at a place that's going to support you. So you have to know what your goals are for the program, um, what you are trying to do as a coach and for that team. And you have to make sure that you're going to get everything that you need from them. Um, and so I think it's important, right, to ask about budget. And unfortunately, that's just part of our job, right, is like, how much travel budget do you have? Are you going to be able to take the girls where you need to take them to get them competition? Um, you have to, you know, talk about scholarship budget. Are you going to be able to get the girls that you feel that you need to continue to develop a team? Um, and so those are really big questions, I believe, at the at the college level. Um, and then any other support questions that you can think of, um, just so that you know when you get there, it's not a surprise that oh, this college really doesn't like women's wrestling. They're going to be pushed in a corner, right? And um, I think it's important to not only ask the 
you know, the administrator, the athletic director that you're interviewing with, but, you know, ask, ask the girls, um, the girls that are actually on the team, ask the assistants, people like that, because to be honest with you, uh, a college is going to tell you what you want to hear, right? For the most part, they're going to make it sound like it's a really great place to be. And then you get there and you're not going to have the support. And so that was my biggest fear when I was looking for a head coaching position. And that's why it took so long. And I was so careful because um, I didn't want to end up in a place that was just not good. Um, and so I can say that I don't think that there's any questions that I didn't ask. I'm sure there is, but nothing that I regret. I, I really do think that you know, I asked the questions that I was encouraged to ask um, by my mentor and and ended up well for me. But that's what I would say. Make sure you have the support. That's the most important. Anyone else want to contribute on that one or do you want me to move on to the next one? All right. Um, transitioning from a college student athlete to a college coach, assistant coach, or a grad assistant coach, um, maybe as a student athlete, you didn't have the career that you wanted and to bring in those accolades. How did you transition into that coaching position? Um, what were the hurdles and then how did you get through those? Okay, I'm going to speak again because I love this question. Um, sorry, guys, I'm talking a lot. But uh, I love this question because this is exactly me. Um, you know, I never got exactly what I wanted to um, in my career. You know, I did good. I was a finalist at nationals and well, pretty much any national tournament you can think of. But I just never really, you know, made the cut and won anything big or did anything like that. And so when I started coaching, I really felt like I didn't have the confidence because I didn't achieve some of those things that I was trying to help other people achieve. Um, and it, it was really hard because I like looked down at myself a lot. Um, but I think the biggest thing to remember is like, just because you're a good wrestler does not make you a good coach. There are tons of great wrestlers, Olympic level wrestlers that I have, you know, been around and um, watch them coach and they just can't transition it very well, right. Or translate it very well. Um, and so if you love the sport and you're willing to give your time into it, there's so much more than just wrestling that makes you a good coach. And so don't let that um, feel, you know, make you feel defeated. Um, you have to, you know, just have confidence that you are learning. And when you don't know something, you're willing to like say, hey, I don't know that, but let me figure it out. Right. And the more you do that, the better coach you're going to become. Like I became like 10 times better of a wrestler just coaching. I feel like if I came back today, I'd win everything. Um, maybe not, but I'm just saying like, you get this confidence in you once you start coaching, because you're looking at it from a whole different perspective. And so I think that probably does keep a lot of people from coaching because they're, they're scared that how others will look at them. And I was like that too. I was like, I never did anything. Why would this person trust me or whatever? Um, but it really, it really does not matter, um, in my opinion. So. I think Gabby said that, you know, so well. Um, I think that if if you have an open mind to always be a student of the sport, to always learn, right? There are different moves that are always coming like in and out of popularity. And so if you're always kind of just being really uh, willing to learn, watching um, wrestling, like I like it's it's just, it's such a fun sport to watch. Um, and then for me personally, um, like I coach um, folk style, um, and I've recently been like, I need to, I need to learn freestyle. And so now I'm kind of going back into that, um, mode of being very uncomfortable because while they are similar, they, they are different. Um, and so now I'm in, and I'm starting to coach it, but also being like, Hey, I'm learning this with you as well. I'm like being very transparent. Like I'm, I'm learning at the same time that we're here, um, and asking questions with you. And so I think if you're willing to be vulnerable, um, willing to ask questions, um, but then again, we're all, we're all constant students of the sport too true too true all, we're all students um the next question is where do you look to find grad assistant assistant coaches and head coaching jobs um Lori do you want to field that one um well so I can add one little piece of advice so I did drop into the chat hey everybody thanks for being on tonight and thanks this is awesome I've learned so much from each of you so just like so grateful for your advice and your time here tonight but um I did drop the coaching positions um into the chat here that we have available on um the wcwc.com 
And so um, there's also a spot on there to add coaching positions, if anyone knows of any, but um, a few listed out there, as well as a link to the NWCA page where there's additional coaching positions. Um, if you go to that website too, quick plug, there's also a lot of great information for you to check out Co collegiate coaching maps, or excuse me, collegiate um, program maps and listings of all the programs in the NAIA and the NCAA. So good stuff. That was a lovely plug. Uh, this next question, um, what do you believe is the biggest hurdle we face when trying to bring female athletes back in the room as coaches and leaders in our sport? And this kind of pairs with the next one at the college level. What is one way to keep women engaged in the wrestling room when they can be pulled in so many directions as we have a family, a work, school that take up more time um, than when they originally planned on joining the team? So whether they're um, a parent or just another person on your college team, how do you keep pulling them in? And then once they've matriculated out of the sport, um, how do you keep pulling them back and retaining them? So I'll go off the, the building a family thing. I think, I don't know if most of you, maybe Emma, you saw me, some of you on the, in, that are on the meeting have seen me throughout my coaching career. I was pregnant three times, nursing for three years. Like it was, it was, a mess. People thought I was going to have a baby at one state tournament. Like it was just, I think to, that we just kind of set the example and you see UCS. I think it, people saw Marcy at Fargo with her baby. Uh, that was a, you know, a whole thing. Um, you know, we're seeing it more and more with, you know, our female coaches with their, their kids, you know, hanging around, running around and it's more accepted now. And then, you know, we're, we're, at, we're everywhere now. So, you know, like at first it probably wasn't, it wasn't a thing, but, but we have to do it. Right. Like, and, and it helped that, you know, my husband was in the corner with me and, and we made it work and our kids are in the mat room with us. Um, and it, and it was a cool, it was a cool family thing, but, um, it, it, it was just how our family works. And, and, you know, you find, you find that room that, that helps, helps make it work for your family. And, you know, and it is hard. I've, I have lost some coaches, um, you know, when they're building their family and, and things like that, but they, they eventually come back when their kids are old enough to wrestle and they're ready to go. And, and then, you know, they're coaching again. So, you know, when their kids turn five and, and they're allowed back in the club or, or whatever. So, um, but, uh, so that, that kind of works out too. So they, they make their, their circle back usually, hopefully. Um, so on the athlete part of it, uh, you know, trying to keep an athlete focused during season when, you know, they go to college and they're away from parents and there's all these things that they can get themselves into different clubs right? Social life, school, jobs, whatever it may be. Um, it's difficult. And I'm sure Emma would agree. It's hard to keep their focus all year. And so I think, you know, you have to set a very strict standard for like, hey, this is our team. This is what our, we're about. But you also have to make sure that you're keeping things fun. So it's a place that they want to be. Right. And so um, if you're not doing that, it, it is going to quickly push them away because there's a lot of fun things that they can find in college. Um, and so but I think it's also important to make sure that you're, you're reiterating that, like, this is the easiest time of your life. Right. As much as they think that it is the hardest thing that they'll ever do, it's not right. Like they're going to have a job someday and they're going to have to find how how to work out around that. And they're going to have kids and like they're going to have to pay bills. So like this is the time that they can just be a kid still, even though they think they're adults and have fun, right. And enjoy and wrestle. You're never going to get that back. And so, you know, when, you know, some of the girls start to get lose focus, I remind them of that. Like you never get this time back. And I promise you, like, if most of us got that time back, we would take it in a second, right. Because we wish we would have done something differently. And so I think always reminding them that setting a standard, making it fun. Um, and just, you know, being, a role model as well, like Monica said, right? Like if you're gonna ask your athletes to do these things, like you should be, you know, doing the same thing. What is it, walking the talk, talking the walk? I don't even know how to say it, but you have to be doing the same thing, right? You have to make sure that you're getting up early, you're eating well, you're working out, you're, 
you know, scheduling stuff and um, teaching them, you know, those things will transition in life. If you do it now and be uncomfortable now, later when you're, you have a kid and you don't want to wake up at 4 a.m. to breastfeed or whatever, you're going to do it because you're used to being uncomfortable. And so reminders like that, right, I think are good. Um, but it is something I'm still trying to figure out. I have no idea, to be honest. Um, that's just what I'm trying to work with. But it is hard. There's a lot of things that pull people away. But keep it fun. That's the go-to, I guess. I love it. Walk to talk, talk to walk, <laughs> do it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to ask one last question and then I'll um, wrap this up. But um, Donnell, how do you help your wrestlers transition to the next level, middle to high school, high school to college, college to elite? Um, what have you done as a coach to help in this process? I love that idea because we often focus so much about like what's happening in that year or that four year cycle or two year cycle that we're with someone and we don't think about how we prepare them to, for that handoff. And so what a beautiful question. Thanks, Donnell. I'll go. Well, to Donnell, that's like my new focus. I think because I have been working so much more with youth, um, I have seen such a like gap and transition between like middle, like youth to transitioning into high school is such a hard transition. Like they expect a lot of things. Um, and it's high school is not what they expect, right? They think that they can come to practice whenever they want, or they can come late, they can leave early, they can go to whatever tournament they want, they can sign up whenever they want, they can do all these things. And then, and then it's not like that, right? They're part of a team and club, club is a team, but it's not, it's a different aspect of team. And like, there's all these things. So like, I'm actually currently working on writing up something, creating something to like, be like, Hey, this is what you expect. This is what you should expect at high school. Cause high school is like more still my mindset, even though I'm working so much with, with littles, um, right now, but, um, like we need to teach them in our different States. Like if we're working with high schoolers, you know, I was always trying to say, Hey, college is like this, like, this is what you need to prepare for, you know, like, like, I'm not all that, like, I'm not the coolest coach in the world. Like, you're not going to, you're going to have a different coach. You need to be coachable by different people. Cause I remember going to college and my college teammates were like, nobody else can coach me, but my college coach, nobody else can coach me, but my dad, nobody, you know, like I remember that kind of thing. So like teaching our kids now, like what transition looks like. And I think that a lot of us know that, like I knew that there was a different transition between high school and college. No, now as a coach, I know that there's a different transition between middle school and high school. So, or youth in high school. So I know what is expected of them as high schoolers. So in my youth, I'm trying to teach them, like I'm preparing you for this stage so that they're not going to go and want to quit because it's different and it's not what they expected. You know, they're not going to be like held up on this pedestal that they think that they're going to be held on. You know, they're not going to be automatic state champs because they were JOC champ or, you know, who knows what. But um, so there's there's a an ego adjustment as there is always, you know, from each transition. So like that, that I'm glad you asked that because that's kind of like what my mind is going to. So I'll probably message you for Donnell and be like, help me, help me write this up, help me create this or help me with some ideas because I think we need to teach our girls or, or all of our kids, all of our youth kids, like to kind of humble them into transitioning into these different spaces that they're going into. <clears throat> It's beautiful. You know, um, one of the first Olympic committee coaching education courses we went to the very first session, they were like, what is a coach and what is a coach's role? And it was about like the original role of a coach was to carry one person or a group of people from one location to another. And it wasn't like, this is your final destination. It was literally like a stage coach in which the horse is pulled, right. And place these people in another place. And we're all just carriers, right. But we're not in destination. We're not on this ride for the next hundred years with them, unfortunately. Um, so how are you preparing that handoff? And I think it's so important as coaches to like be thinking about how am I picking them up and I'm entering them into my um, 
our program, our on-ramps and the same way, how am I off-ramping them and putting them into the next good place, the safe place where they're empowered and they can make those choices of where they wanna go next. Um, with that, I just wanna say thank you for attending the first of three sessions um, aimed to help women enter the sport as um, coaches, advocates, officials, and state leaders, media members, and more. Um, we value each of your time and your commitment to growing the sport, and we thank each of our speakers tonight for giving their time and sharing their knowledge with us. Um, we hope that you leave feeling inspired and excited for tomorrow and Thursday night speakers. We have some great stuff coming up. Tomorrow night's session is focused on honing and growing. How do you elevate yourself as a coach and make those next leaps, whether it's um, from age levels or, and from recreational to competitive, or if it's just like, hey, I'm getting better every single day and how am I doing that as a coach? Um, and then Thursday night session will be focused on exploring careers outside of coaching, whether that's an administrator, an advocate, an athletic trainer, a doctor, um, a media member, an official, um, and so many more. And so finding your space in that sport because coaching isn't for everyone, but we do need everyone to push the sport forward.